How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Dead Jester Productions podcast, episode number 222. I'm your host, Joshua J. Moskers, joined this week by special guest Jordan Miller, the lead developer of uh, Crypto Moon Tree. Moon Tree, as well as uh, Crypto AI Project Satori. Thank you for being here. Thank you. This is awesome. Happy to have you here. Why don't you tell people a little about yourself? What it is you got going on? What you do? So, um, yeah, so I'm the lead developer of a crypto startup called Moon Tree. We are uh, working on some uh, wallets and some UTXO based, if if anybody knows what that means, uh, uh, chains and tokens and that kind of stuff. And um, on the side, I have been building something called Satori for the last two years. So I've been doing it on my nights and my weekends. I've been building it. We're getting ready to launch that project. It's a community-oriented project. It's a, it's a blockchain that predicts the future, right? It's a crypto mm -hmm. AI project. It uses AI to kind of make predictions about the future. And uh, that's kind of my main thing. I mean, that's what I'm uh, what I love to talk about is crypto and AI. Nice. Yeah, I... I'm more familiar, like I, I have a baseline understanding of, of cryptocurrency and the digital currency side of things and, you know, AI, but I definitely like to, to jump into it in a more in-depth discussion with you because one, I think it's super fascinating and two, I think a lot of people, and we talked about this briefly before recording, a lot of people have like a cursory knowledge of it that don't fully understand what it is or what it's capable of or how it works. Bef so I guess before we dive into the, the details, what is it like, can you provide a brief overview of how cryptocurrency works? Because I know a lot of people, like when they think of cryptocurrency, they think of Bitcoin, right? That's the yes. cryptocurrency that people know about. Like, what has your experience been like with cryptocurrency in general and how it actually functions as a currency? Yeah. So like Bitcoin, definitely a currency. Um you know, back in the day, I heard about Bitcoin. I heard about Bitcoin way back in like 2012 or 11 or 12 or 13, maybe. And so I was learning about it and I was a techie. I am a techie, I'm a developer. So I was interested in how in the world does this technology work? And so it's built on something called blockchain technology. Blockchain, all these computers are on a network. They're all trying to kind of... Um, solve a puzzle, right? And the first mm -hmm. first computer that solves a puzzle raises its hand and says, I solved the puzzle. And for that, um, all the other computers say, okay, well, you solve the puzzle. You're the one that gets to kind of make, make some little block. That's why it's called a blockchain. Mm -hmm. A little piece of information that we're all going to, you know, recognize as true because you solved the puzzle before everybody else. And that's basically how it works. Well, on top of that kind of structure, that kind of pattern, you can build, you know, the, what is the easiest thing you can build on that? It's currency, right? I mean, because what do you need to do if you want to have a currency? You all have to come into consensus. You all have to agree on how much money everybody has. And that's like, that's all you have to do, actually. Mm -hmm. If you send money to somebody, you want everybody else to know it. And so blockchain is a way for everybody else to know it without having some kind of centralized entity like a bank that um, kind of does that, kind of manages that. Because what if the bank lies to everybody, right? Like it can happen. So, yeah. so in order to not have that kind of uh, centralized trust, you can use a blockchain to make kind of a decentralized trusted network that can come to consensus on some piece of information. And Bitcoin is the first kind of uh, application of that. Currency is the first application of that. Okay. I know one of the, the things that I've heard that I don't fully understand, I guess, is how cryptocurrency functions, like Bitcoin in particular. Obviously, there's a thing called like Bitcoin mining, where the way I've heard it explained is that it's basically a big, long equation and each time a section of it is mined, I suppose, it the next section of the equation is harder to solve. And that's 
how accurate is that? And like, that's can a you pretty good better? explanation. Pretty good. So, um, like when I mentioned, like all the computers are trying to figure out a puzzle, that's the Bitcoin mining process. Mm-hmm. So what the puzzle is specifically is they're trying to find a number, a, a number, a specific number that matches some criteria and they don't know what that number is ahead of time, right? So in order to find that number, they basically just guess and check, right? They're not doing anything special. They're not doing any computer magic, AI stuff, nothing. They're just r- creating a random number Mm-hmm. checking if it matches, you know, this criteria and saying, well, that didn't match. Now, the criteria is based on the data that was in the last block. So they can mm-hmm. never know ahead of time, like two years ahead of time or something like that. They never know ahead of time what it's going to be. So they can't get a head start. So nobody has kind of a, a head start um, in front of the rest of the network. They're all on an even playing ground. So um, I think that's pretty pretty accurate. What you were told is okay. that they're trying to um, compete on randomly guessing the correct number. Mm-hmm. I have a side question then too. Is there a qualifier for these to separate the different cryptocurrencies, and how does that work? Like, let's say a Bitcoin, you know, has a specific. Uh, this is obviously nonsense the way I'm going to phrase this, but like. You know, it has like one, two, three is the number for the first Bitcoin block. How is that differentiated from uh, like a different cryptocurrency, for example? Yeah, so they they do have different designations and that's kind of getting deep into the code where they're like, okay, um, we're going to use, I think it's the number one or something for Bitcoin and we're going to use the letter um, M or I don't even remember, okay. but we're going to use some designation in the code so that we all know we're talking about this other network, Ravencoin or, you know, mm-hmm. something else. And then there's not only those differentiations within the, the kind of traditional blockchain um, ecosystem, I suppose, but there's actually completely different di- uh, distributed consensus ecosystems now. So we, we could even put like, Ethereum and the EVM and all that kind of stuff over on a different consensus mechanism. It's proof of stake. So it's even in a, you know, it's in a different kind of ballpark, um, but it has a lot of similarities. And there's even more centralized, but pseudo decentralized systems uh, like Hedera, which is, which has got like 40 nodes or 39 nodes and mm-hmm. so it's somewhat decentralized. Those nodes are owned by different companies, but it's not actually decentralized because if they all, if they all agree, then, uh, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a very small network, basically. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it's a big space. And so I would call this, you know, everybody might just call this crypto or whatever, but it's, it's a lot of different ways to come to consensus. So it's a lot of different technologies for distributed consensus in general. Okay. The next setup question, I guess we'll call it, is how cryptocurrency gets its value. Because uh, obviously you can buy like Bitcoin and Ethereum and things like that on like public markets, but the inherent value of it, like where does that come from other than, like outside of investing into it? Yeah, there is no value outside of investing because all mm-hmm. value comes from humans. Like if a human is willing to give you something for that, then it has value and it has value to the person willing to give you something for that. And then, um, you know, with currency in general, like whether it's gold or dollars or Bitcoin or anything, you mm-hmm. know that if other if other people want this, I can, if I have it, they're going to do something for me. Right. So so that's where its value comes from as far as being a currency. In it's the case basically propped up by investing into it, essentially. You could yeah, you could put it that way. Now you might I'm say okay, it rudely. Yeah, I I that's, that's but, pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, like I mean, consider gold. You know, mm-hmm. like it's a currency, it's it's but it's not really used as a currency, right? But sure, it has yeah. in, like value that we know everybody would like some gold if you're willing to give it away. Right. So, um, and, and it comes from being scarce 
comes from mm-hmm. being like, if it's gold, you know, it's gold, you know, you can kind of test it, you know what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the disconnect is the tangibility of it. Like gold, like right. literally cash, you know, uh, whatever. Like it's the same thing with like that I deal with. Like I'll relate this back to what I do is like marketing. Like it's easier to sell a physical product than the idea of something, right? Like right. When I sell advertising, it's like, I'm selling you on the idea that people are going to come and buy your product as opposed to I'm going to sell you a cell phone. It's a physical right. thing. I can show it to you. You can hold it. It's it's hard to quantify the value of something when there's nothing physical to interact with. I feel like, yeah, isn't it weird? Like like this concept of like social media, mm-hmm. like so, there's no physical social media thing, right? But we all yeah. know Instagram, Facebook, and whatever else, right? We know it, and so uh, I think Bitcoin is a lot like that. Like, what does Instagram allow you to do? It allows you to appear into other people's lives, and you know, for whatever purpose, mm-hmm. to keep up with them or something else, whatever. But with yeah, Bitcoin, the users are the product as opposed or the, oh, right. yeah, like the, the users. selling point, right? Because the, right. the whole point of it is selling the attention of the users to advertisers. The actual social media side of it is just the mechanism with which you transition between ads to consumers to, you know, Facebook or whatever. Right. But it's, it's like a structure of information is what you're mm-hmm. getting. And so it's not tangible in that way. It's like the information is the value. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's been gold bugs who didn't see the value of Bitcoin from the beginning, like Peter Schiff, for example, and he doesn't see it from the beginning because I think it's this tangible thing. He's like, you can't hold it like you can gold. You can't, it's not as valuable, but even dollars, even though they have a physical, kind of representation because we print them out and we put them on paper. Um, it's just the idea of somebody else's labor. That's what a dollar is. It's the idea of somebody else's labor. They'll do something for you if you give them this paper. It's essentially so, a different form of an IOU to an extent. Right. It's like, yeah. you're giving me this good. I'm giving you this paper that's an IOU saying I'll give this to you. And then they can trade off your IOU for a different physical product. And it's all just an IOU, you know, through the process of a banking system. Yeah. And so it seems like Bitcoin is the quintessential uh, um, expression of an IOU, right? It's this arbitrary thing, but Mm -hmm. there's a limited supply and you can have a Bitcoin without having any physical representation. Now, what you do need to have is a memory of the private key, you know, you got to write it down or you got to memorize it. You know, that's the physical expression of the Bitcoin is if you hold the key to that wallet, then you have the Bitcoins. If you don't have that piece of information, then somebody else might have it. And they have they have control over how to send it, who to send it to. You know, they have control over the the idea of the IOU. What's your thought on a lot of these sort of uh, get rich quick scam coins, so to speak? You know, it's been very popular, especially amongst like uh, content creators online, where it's just very quick, like, hey, this is not, I mean, Dogecoin, but that's not what I'm thinking of. Like, there are some where it's just like Poo Coin was one I saw at one point, where it's obviously a meme currency, where it's just trying to get investors real quick, people trying to get in cash out and make money extremely quickly knowing that it's not a long-term investment like do you think that devalues uh like bitcoin ethereum like things like that more long-term you know plans just because it gives it a bad name to an extent yeah maybe to an extent maybe a little bit i mean look i am such an idiot when it comes to this kind of stuff (laughs) and the reason is i'm in 2013 i'm i'm looking at I'm watching these other chains be built and a lot of them have really cool utility like uh, Monero and, and, you know, Litecoin. And so there's all Mm -hmm. these other chains that are like, Hey, what if we tweak Bitcoin to work this way and we could get this cool feature out of it. It's neat. And so I'm looking at all those and I'm thinking these are cool, you know, and then come the meme coins or the meme chains back then, Dogecoin, Mm -hmm. for example. And um, I looked at it. 
way back, right when it was starting. Like I, you know, and I thought that is the dumbest thing I've ever thought. <laughs> like who would be dumb enough to buy that shit? Well, apparently there's a social need to, you know, laugh and have a good time. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't get it. People like these meme coins. That's okay. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to play God or government and say, Hey, you can't do that or this, or, you know, but I didn't buy into it because it just wasn't for me. And so I've mm -hmm. stayed away from these, this kind of ecosystem, you know, kind of the, I don't know if it's just pump or dump or, you know, it's a, it's a medium of communication though, mm -hmm. you know, whether we like it or not, or whether it's, it's, you know, people use it just to get rich. Right. I mean, that's what I'm yeah. looking at, but it seems like it's a medium of communication um, because it's, it's memes. I, okay. you know, I don't know how to explain it. So, so I don't get into it and I don't invest in it. I don't know how to, how to play that game. So I'm kind of a nerd. I'm in the tech. I'm not, I'm not going to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it sort of is about, we briefly touched on this before the recording that we're not experts in this field, but like NFTs to me are one of those things where it's, it's a meme. It's sort of like a, a fad almost like, I've not heard anything in main like mainstream media or anything like, you know, in general, really about NFTs in a year maybe or whatever. Right. You know, it, it was one of those things that blew up really quickly. It seemed like, a, oh, this is an easy way to make money. Buy NFTs like the, was it the Board Ape Yacht Club? It was like the yeah. big one. They had oh, celebrities yeah. endorsing it. You know, it, it was such a, a big thing. And now it's kind of vanished into thin air when people realize they we're kind of left holding the bag on a lot of it. That's right. That's, I mean, I knew, I knew friends that were like, man, I got these NFTs. They're up, uh, you know, a thousand percent. I'm going to hold them. And mm -hmm. I was like, you know, you might want to sell, you know, I mean, those ones, you know, and people have been telling me that since the beginning of Bitcoin, Hey, you know, Bitcoin's a hundred bucks. You got to sell that, you know, sell it at a thousand, you know? And I'm like, well, okay. When it's real tech, mm -hmm. You know, when it's when it's new functionality that humanity has never had ever, you should probably keep that, you know, keep it. But if it's, you know, a meme coin and you think everybody's going to fall in love with it, um, they're probably not. So, you know, get out. Yeah. <laughs> and so I never entered in the first place. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, it just I think there's a hesitancy creeping into some people especially people who are not technically literate at all, where they're just like, this is clearly a scam of some sort or whatever. And you have some people who are definitely trying to scam others with it just because of the inherent an anonymity of the internet. So I yeah. can see it being a difficult market or field to, to navigate as someone who's genuinely trying to make a, uh, you know, a valuable product that can actually, people can actually use, you know, in a That's positive totally way. That's totally right. Yeah. The people can actually use it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, that's, I, everywhere I look, I see scams nowadays. Mm -hmm. And not just in the crypto, like in products, in real products that people like love. I'm like, dude, I would never use that. <laughs> and it seems mm -hmm. like a scam to me, but whatever, you know, if you like it, then go ahead. But um, I mean, that's, I see it all over the place. It's it's almost like everything has a tiny element of being a scam. Almost like saying everything that you can say has a tiny element of being the truth, no matter how big of a lie it is, and a, and a tiny element of being a lie, no matter how accurate or true it is. It mm. almost seems like that's just an inevitable law of the universe to me. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of times, too, is reinventing the wheel in a way that it doesn't need to be done in an or in order to increase profits while seeming like they're doing something better. Look at the, ah, oh, what I forget what the, the title is, what they're actually called, but, uh, new, like the new soda cans that are taller, but thinner. I forget that what they're called. I don't know, uh, <laughs> but it's actually like 30% cheaper to make them because it's easier to make the top of the can. Cool. And they charge an increased, it's like a little bit more expensive than traditional cans. And <laughs> so their profits have increased, like I'll make up a number, 
forty percent per can, right? Uh, while the cost has gone down, so they're making a bunch more money on it. Yeah, and wow. but people think, oh, I'm getting more for it because it's a taller can, not realizing it's literally the exact same amount of soda. Isn't that wild? Mm-hmm. Oh, and you know what? The one that gets me the most, you know, I thought maybe I'm just a stodgy old, you know, guy or something because. I remember being a kid and looking at bottled water and being like, what, you know, water is free out of your tent. What's the hell? Yeah. Uh, you know, this is kind of how I was raised, like very frugal, very, you know, thrifty and, you know, so, but the one that gets me the most these days, ugh, the, the liquid something IV or something, I don't even know. And I don't they, know any, they, anything uh, they about the technology. Yeah. Oh, they, are they? Yeah. Well, then I won't say anything. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. You know what? I, there's a reason I don't bring up sponsors during the show anymore. I put the links in the description, but I don't mention anything on the show anymore because one, no one said anything to me about it. And <laughs> two, it breaks up the show too much. So I'm just uh, like, it is what it is. If they want to complain. They can complain. But okay. Well, if you don't mind, you know what? You can just edit it out. If I say something that's like too bad, you know? Okay. Yeah. So, but the thing I don't get about them is I'm like, okay, I'm watching the commercial, you know, whatever. And then it comes on and it's like, you know, they're claiming it gives you more water than water. I was like, what? What is this? You put something that's not water into your body and it's going to give you more water than water. No. I was like, no, no, that is a scam. I don't know what they're thinking they're doing there, but. That's not good for you. It cannot be good. Uh, it, it, it's it one hurt. of the main things with with energy, not energy drinks, but like drinks of that nature, where it's it's not supposed to be an energy drink, but it'll have like electrolytes and things like that. Is like especially like sugar free as well. Like that's the big thing for a lot of energy drinks. Like oh, there's zero sugar, so it's healthy, but you're just drinking like huge amounts of salt, right? <laughs> so like it and people ignore that. Like I, yeah. I actually drank like liquid IV quite a bit, uh, for a while because like I would get up every day and I, I ride my bike. I usually do like a two hour ride, which is like the equivalent to between like 25, 30 miles. It's fucking exhausting. Is it? Um, wow. It's not, don't, people are going to like be like, there's no way you ride 30 miles. It's me sitting in the office here on my bike with like very little resistance. It's oh, more about yeah. just the pedaling and like the endurance of it, not building up muscle or anything like that. So it's not nearly as bad as it, it sounds. Um, but I, I used to drink a lot, like, like I said, like the liquid IV every day because I wanted the energy back, get trying to build up like the energy and everything before going into work. But I just, I drink water. It's all I drink at this point. It's literally water. And like oh, no. once a month I'll drink a sugar free, uh, cherry vanilla Coke zero. Cause they're delicious. Good for like, you, that's, man. That's awesome. That's a, that's a, that's a treat. I think getting thing. back to the simplified living is like the way to go, really. It's it's cheaper. <laughs> it's cheaper. It's more healthy, probably. It, it blows my mind how people will like justify like, oh, we just go through like the drive through because it's nice and cheap. I'm like, it is infinitely more expensive to go out to eat than just making something fresh at home when it's even better. Oh, yeah. Like I, I cook a homemade dinner literally every single night unless it's uh-huh. like a there's a, for some reason we have to be out and about. It's a special thing, but nice work. I, no offense to people out there, I can cook better than most restaurants. You know, <laughs> it, it's just, I don't know. I prefer cooking at home. It's better. I get to make exactly what I want whenever I want. And oh, so much awesome. nicer. And it's way healthier because I'm getting fresh, like chicken and beef and whatever, as opposed to here's frozen chicken we've had sitting in our freezer for two weeks. And we're going to throw it on the grill, cook it up, and all the other junk that people have been having their food made in as well. It's yeah. It's not processed too. food, man. That's just not good for you. No. And the way they sell it is, uh, with anxiety, you know, all sales mm-hmm. is anxiety. I was taking my daughter to school today and she said, um, she's young. She mm-hmm. said, are commercials supposed to make you feel bad? I was like, yes, that's why we turn them off whenever they come on. Like, yes, 
they if they can make you feel bad, they can get your money. Yeah, they're they're trying to make you feel bad. Exactly. Good job. So yeah, don't do it. It's especially like I work in advertising and marketing. It's like baffling what's allowed in the U.S. in general. Like wow. marketing of medicines is insane to me. I was like, oh. you're sent, you're telling people who do not have a medical background what they should be talking to their doctor about. Like that blows my mind. That's insane. Yeah, there's that. Wow. Like going back to the food thing. I know. Oh, I want to get back on topic here then too. But going back to the food thing, like the the amount of preservatives and things in our food is is insane. Uh, you go to the store, like how long does bread last? I mean, our, ours doesn't last because I, you know, we go through it pretty quickly, but it lasts like a week or two. You go to, you know, the UK or something and you're lucky to get a full week out of your loaf of bread because it's actually fresh and not packed with all sorts of sugars and stuff. Exactly. And that's I've noticed sort of that. I've noticed foods. that with milk. It's kind of freaked me out because I remember being young and milk was like a month at the most or something. You know, it was, mm-hmm. we were always like, okay, is the date good? But now I look at the date and I'm like, I got like three months out of this. Like we're yeah. definitely going to finish this. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of freaks me out a little bit. <laughs> I'm like, what is in this? I, uh, yeah. I don't have enough experience living in a big city, but like where I'm at now, we're fortunate in that we're surrounded by like Amish and stuff like that. Like oh, Amish people, Mennonites. And so like, it's very easy to get like fresh milk oh, nice. from farms, which is nice. We have butchers. Uh, in town so i can get fresh milk fresh meats it's super nice fresh vegetable like everything is super super fresh and i just buy it as like an as needed basis where it's like this is what we're gonna have for dinner this week let's buy all the ingredients so it's not gonna get spoiled i don't need to freeze it or anything so it's super convenient in that regard Sweet, but yeah it's cheaper it's so much cheaper too (laughs) I, some people I work with will order like DoorDash or they'll go out to like a fast food place for lunch. And I'm like, I'm being generous at $10 a meal because I'm sure they're cost more than that at this point. But that's like 50 bucks a week on food just for lunch. Yeah. And like, I can go to the store and buy a, like a whole pack of, you know, like chicken for like seven bucks and, you know, get some side of for like a hundred for like a hundred dollars. I get a week's worth of meals, three meals a day, plus the weekend. I'm like, it's insanity. Like how much money people waste on, on fast food and just not making their own lunches or whatever. So true. And it's all because of convenience and anxiety. Mm -hmm. But I've digressed way too far off the point at this point. (laughs) Uh, I want what the reason I asked a lot of these questions leading is because I want to at least provide the, the basic information so people would be able to understand uh, the discussion going forward, which is, uh, I guess we'll start at Moon Tree. It's like, how did sure. you get involved in this and and kind of give an overview of it? So I was working as a business uh, business intelligence developer. So that, you know, I made some models and I did some, you know, AI kind of stuff, but mostly it meant um, uh, supporting the group. It mostly mm-hmm. meant application development for the data modelers, and the data scientists uh, and the actuary. Okay. So it, it, I was kind of doing application development. I would, you know, figure out a way to deploy all their models, get everything up and running, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Get uh, the database talking to them and, and the reporting system and all that kind of. So I did a lot of that. And then um, I was contacted by this Moon Tree organization. And they said, hey, why don't you come work for us? I wasn't looking, you know, I was I was like on a career track. I was like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to work here. Maybe someday I'll be kind of somebody in the lead of this business intelligence group. And, you know, that'll be great, right? Like yeah. that's my career. I was pretty, pretty much resigned to that idea. Um, and then they contacted me and gave me this option. And I was like, oh, I've always wanted to work in crypto. Like, yeah. like I mean, I was doing like projects earlier, but I had never worked in crypto, derived an income. And so I was like, oh, that'd be cool. And ah, gosh, you know, I have a bunch of ideas that I want to do. And you know, being in the startup space might, might put me in a better position to do those. And... 
you know, I work hard, I work long hours, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. I, I figured that if I didn't take the opportunity that was, you know, laid at my feet, basically, I would never get out of out of that stodgy old company, which was a nice company, but yeah. I would never be able to pursue a dream or do anything like that. Hmm. So I took the plunge, right? And so that's my story. Um, I got out. It was not easy, right? I'd never, I mean, a lot of de- developers uh, would hop from place to place. All my friends that were developers, mm-hmm. they'd go one place, work for six months, two years, and then they, they're gone. Right. And the reason they did it is so that they could increase their pay because mm-hmm. they could do that. Right. They could like increase their pay by 30 percent each hop. Right. And so they're mm-hmm. making a lot of money. And my strategy was like, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm more of a let's play it safe. Let's let's just chill out. It can be hard to just take like, a, a leap of faith going to a different company. Like you never know, like, oh, what if this doesn't work out, you know, like that. Yeah. I was in a similar boat. Like that's literally how I ended up where I'm at now, like looking forward and like looking now by the end of the year to be fully self-employed. But like I was working at a job where I was like very comfortable making good money and it was just very like bland. I was just like, eh, whatever. Um, but company I work for now reached out to me out of the blue and they're like, Hey, we found your resume on like indeed or something. I don't even remember. And they're like, Hey, you know, are you interested? And I'm like, sure. Let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. But I know at the time I was just kind of like, hopefully this works out because I'm taking a big risk. <laughs> right. It's kind of scary. Right. I mean, I think I was more scared than I should have been, <laughs> but but I was scared. And but I did make the leap and um, never looked back because mm-hmm. it not only gave me more expertise in the crypto space, which I'm really you know happy about that, but mm-hmm. it gave me the last piece of the puzzle, really, to do this mm-hmm. to do this dream of Satori. Yeah. You know, I had the I had the skills and expertise I needed from the application development uh, kind of stuff I learned. And then to be able to bring in crypto, I could now connect that with crypto and everything I had learned about AI um, and and bring it in to Satori and, and start to build this thing on my own. So I've I've built Satori, most of it on. My, I've had a few friends come now. But um, I've built most of Satori nights and weekends over the past two years, and getting close to launch, um, I'm you know I'm happy that we've been able to do this without any kind of investor you know uh, VC money that we have to pay back um, or that we have to sacrifice some of the token or equity to, and so you know it's it's just been a really good experience. Nice. Yes, yeah, it's, it's sort of the, the mindset I had when I, I took my position was, you know, this is giving me the, the last bit of information, the last skill set I need in order to go into my passion project. And I, I, I don't know, I really value that opportunity. That's why I went for it. You know, I think a lot of times, and it's not inherently wrong, but I know like a lot of times people go into a business like, ah, oh, you know, it, like I owe them a favor. You know, they gave me the opportunity for a job to pay me money. Now I owe them. And not that that's inherently wrong, but at the same time, I'm like, it's not really, you know, you're providing them work and like a service and in return, they're paying you for it. It's a True. business transaction, which is how I generally look at it. Yep. Uh, and I don't know, like I, I know like just people I've worked with have always felt bad. Like, oh, I've, I want to do like this, but like, I feel bad just like leaving. I'm like, why? It's a business deal. It's, it's literally all it is. You know, it, I get, I get annoyed sometimes when I see businesses go like, Oh, we're a family here. And I'm, oh, like, yeah. I'm like, are you annoying. like, yeah, it, I know that that's really the case. You know, typically family doesn't withhold money from family members because they don't appreciate their work ethic. Like, yeah, is what it is. you know, I get, I get it. I get, you know, I've, I've had to make business decisions before plenty of times. I do understand it to an extent, but yeah, it's just taking that leap of faith to uh, really go for your passion project if you're in a position to do so is it's typically worth it, especially if you're being able to get that final piece of that skill set needed to 
really round your yourself out and put yourself in the best possible position to succeed. That's right. Yeah. So that's what I feel like has happened. You know, at the moon tree, um, I haven't left. I mean, because, mm-hmm. well, I still need money, but, but I would like to not have to leave moon tree yeah. because, you know, I do feel like that kind of loyalty, it's a small group, right? It's not mm-hmm. this huge, you know, faceless organization. It's just a small startup. And I want them to succeed and to, you know, make money. So, um, you know, I don't know. I get some of that feeling. But, you know, the bigger the organization, the more you really shouldn't feel any loyalty. And it goes really quick, <laughs> I think, yeah. you know. Like it's a business. Yeah, I don't want to make it that. seem like I'm I'm saying all businesses are bad and it's not my intention at all. Oh, totally. But like you said, like it, there's a critical mass where it goes from a small mom and pop business to the point where you're making decisions like it'd be in the company's best interest to do that. Right. right. Like you, you act like the company is an entity on its own as yeah. though you're not sitting there making decisions yourself. Yeah. That's going to affect so, like your friends, you yeah. know, like people you care about. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't want people to get the wrong idea and be like, you know what? You're right. Companies are evil. I'm going to go in and stop caring about my job. Like, no, no, please don't do that. Right. But yeah, I know that's, I could definitely appreciate the scenario you went through because it's very similar to my own, if not in a different field at least, but yeah, I, it could be hard. Like I said, like where I'm at now, I was definitely given a very, a good opportunity to expand my skill set, at least in the beginning. Now I'm, this is part of the reason why I'm getting ready to go fully a uh, self-employment route because it's a uh, situation has changed. I'll word it that way. <laughs> oh yeah. But yeah. It, I don't know. It, I've always wanted to be self-employed. I've realized it's a bit riskier, but I, I don't like having like uh someone watching over my shoulder the entire time for no reason. Often, you know, it's, it's like, I know what I'm doing. I can, I can take care of myself. I'm a big boy. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. But I, I, I do like, especially if it's just me, you know, it, I, I'm the sole person responsible for everything. So there's that pressure, but at the same time, it's like, I don't have to worry about, you know, throwing someone else under the bus. Like I, you know, this didn't work out well. So now you're the one paying the price because the company, you know, can't afford to keep you on wherever. Like it, it's just me. Yeah. You don't no. want to hurt anybody. Totally. Yeah. So it, all the pressure is on me, but at the same time, it's like, I don't have to deal with worrying about how it affects other people. You know, obviously I have a family to take care of, but I don't have to worry about how it affects someone else's family if the yeah. business isn't going well. I don't like that dealing with that pressure of it. Right. So it is what it is, but I don't know. I, I definitely prefer it, especially if I decide to do a complete 180 and go in a completely different route, which could also happen. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Let's shift that business focus entirely. Hard. Yeah. <laughs> Pivoting. I mean, that's, that's a part of the early stages. Yeah. But yeah. So you obviously you worked at moon tree, you switched over, you're focusing on growing to Tori. What is your, what's your plan for that? Like how, how do you see, that going and like the the growth of it and building on it like how does that how does that look in your mind so we're building to launch right so Mm -hmm. what we've been able to build so far is the application of you can download the satori neuron Mm -hmm. and it will then connect up through the blockchain through the network um, on this distributed uh, network it will connect up to all the neighboring like satori nodes right Mm -hmm. and it will it will reach out and it will say, hey, uh, what kind of data do you want me to predict? Because it's all about prediction. This whole network is about future prediction. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the network will respond and say, well, why don't you predict you know, this data stream? Because you know, nobody's predicting that one yet or whatever. And then it will start to listen to that data stream and generate predictions. It makes models through its automated AI engine. It generates models, and and then it broadcasts those those predictions out to the network, saying, "This is what I think is going to happen in the future on this particular data stream." Mm-hmm. 
and any of the other nodes can can take that information in and use it in their own models. Uh, they can kind of leverage the work of each other in that way. And basically, that is what we have created so far. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got we've got it right, and and we're we've got a few things to improve before we can launch. You know, we want them to be able to share historic data sets better than they can right now. Um, stuff like that. So we're, we're improving the code. Um, but once we get to the point where it's, it's improved, we don't see any more bugs, you know, there's, I don't know, it looks, it looks pretty good. Then we'll launch. And at that point, we'll probably just try to focus on improving the AI because that will always need to be improved, you know, but the infrastructure of the network and the blockchain will be there. Um, well, so we'll focus on improving the AI and we'll focus on scaling the network. You know, we've yeah. got a lot, we need to get a lot of miners, a lot of people that download the software and run it for it to be really powerful. Mm-hmm. So we're going to work on scaling the network so it can make better and better predictions. Um, those predictions, you know, there's another it's like thing. looking at a single object from more and more points of view. It gives you a better picture yeah. of how it looks. Yes, exactly. And that single object that we're looking at is we're trying to make a holistic view of our society, our civilization, our economy, our environment, because all of these things are interrelated. And they all, you know, they all affect each other. And so if you can watch data streams that are key to all of these things, then you can see how they're affecting one another. And, um, And so we're trying to make a world model. And so that single object that the Satori system is looking at is the world. You know, it's trying to make a world Mm -hmm. model and it's got to look at a lot of different things in order to do it. So, um, so that's why we need to scale. You're right. You're exactly right. Mm -hmm. Um, Each neuron can look at more than one thing, right? I kind of simplified Mm -hmm. what was going on there. They can all look at more than one thing at a time and make more than one prediction about those things. But there is a limit. Like they can't look at everything all the time, right? So they do have to kind of divvy up the space and kind of share with each other. And uh, that's why it's kind of a network. Makes sense. So how does how does this transition into the, the crypto side of things? Well, the crypto lets us build a distributed network that anybody can join and that we can trust their data and stuff like that. So Mm. it lets us, it brings in the decentralized aspect, you know, Mm. the decentralized consensus. If we didn't have that kind of technology, we would be doing this under one roof and, you know, like a Google or, you know, chat GPT, open AI, basically, Mm. we would be doing this under one roof. We would centralize everything. And I do not think that's a great idea. Because if we did that, we would be in control of, you know, we could censor, basically, is what it comes down to. We could censor all the predictions. We could basically lie um, about what those predictions are. And you really don't want that in a future predicting Oracle because... You could easily manipulate everything then. Exactly. You Mm -hmm. can basically issue uh, self-fulfilling prophecies. You know, if people, if people watch this and they're like, oh, that thing predicts the future really well, and then you manipulate those predictions, then they're going to behave as if the, you know, true, the future that you predicted will come true and then they'll make it come true. And so that's a a self-fulfilling prophecy feedback mechanism. It's like going into a subway and expecting soggy tomatoes. It's always going to (laughs) happen. And so we really, uh, we really want to decentralize it. And we have to use the crypto technology in order to do that. Blockchain technology and other distributed consensus technologies. How, how would you suggest people first get started in this if, as like a user? Like what's the best way they can get involved in it and get started from like a usability standpoint of, like, like I, obviously I can go on there, I can, I can join, I can download. How do they get started being involved in it? Involved? Wow. Yeah. Uh, then they can go onto the website. There's a Discord link 
Mm-hmm. You know, you can go into like join under the join tab or yeah. whatever it is. And then you can hit the discord link, get in there. That's where we discuss everything. You can keep up with our progress. You know, we've been having uh, weekly progress announcements every, every week for this year, before this year, even, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, you can keep up with us that way. You can participate. You can, you know, if you're a developer and you want to come on a program, you can talk to us in the development channels. You know, if you have questions or you want to test things, you can you can go in there and kind of, you know, say, I'll test this and I found a bug mm-hmm. or whatever else. Um, also, you know, if you just want to download it, you can go to the website and just hit download and follow the steps. It's pretty easy. Um, it's pretty easy. I mean, there's only a few steps. Most people are on Windows or Mac and and those seem to install really easily. And so everything's, we've tried to make it as easy to scale as possible. I will say, I do love your website. I love the very like simplistic art style of it. It Makes it easy (laughs) to read. Isn't that fun? I kind of like that too. And and, uh, when it goes to black and white up there in the Mm -hmm. top right corner, I kind of like that feature. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's very nice and clean compared to a lot of the websites I work with on a daily basis. Is it? You like yeah. it? I mean, you know what? We threw it together. This kind of exemplifies our philosophy of creation at Satori mm-hmm. because we think, okay, this is a big project. We have a small team. Okay. So I mean, we started for a long time with just one person on the team, me. Yeah. So um, I said, we cannot do anything that doesn't need to be done. So we have to simplify everything. We, we have to simplify everything as, as much as possible, as early as possible. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of the strategy we've taken, you know, is basically essentialism. We try to be essential. We don't do anything that doesn't need to be done right now. We just do what's essential at the moment. And um, yeah, so that's how we've been building this from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think... Having it simplified makes it easier to understand, makes it people more receptive of it. Like even on like the the main page, like your vision, right? You have the video at the top, which is super straightforward. And then you have the the breakdown of underneath, which is mainly text and images, but it's all super, super clean and easy to read. Uh, one of the issues I, I run into with a lot of people is they try and it's not just the volume of content it's the quality of it that matters and you're providing a lot of very valuable you know overview like this is how this works this is why this this is done this way and whatever some people i work with or it's just let's just put out as many photos and videos as we can showing off the products or whatever because that'll convince people to buy it but there's no reason to especially with like vanity project products like high-end furniture Mm. or like high-end vehicles where it's like people the people buying these don't care about why they should be buying it. Right. right? They just know that it's expensive and fancy, you know? And, yeah. Yeah, and, totally. And it's different vein. Like I know on yours, you have the roadmap here as well, which breaks it down super well, which is nice. And like right now you're right in the, between the, the beta release and the, the phase one, but like having that broken down is super nice. Uh, it, it lets people understand like where you're going with it you know, shows where you've been, what you've been working on, having yeah. that background of it, uh, it lets people feel more connected to the work and it definitely, it's more transparent, which I think also builds it, uh, trust. Like I noticed even on like throughout the different, you know, pages, like the, uh, the mining page and everything like that too. I'm just going right down the list essentially, like showing all of these breakdowns of everything just definitely builds up trust with people just because it's very simplified, very straightforward, easy to understand. And it's, uh, I, well, I really I, like your website. It's pretty cool. May, yeah. I really appreciate that feedback because I kind of feel like, uh, that's the right way to do it. And, mm-hmm. and I see these other projects that kind of appeal to, um, I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's maybe they appeal to, to, uh, you know, they treat the user as a dumb idiot. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they, I get offended 
when I go somewhere and I'm the, every, everything is implying that I'm a moron, you know? <laughs> so it's the mindset. Uh, a lot of times they will take, like I've, I've worked with a number of web developers cause I don't have that coding background where I can build everything out from scratch myself. Yeah. And the mindset is more often than not, imagine you're designing this for someone who doesn't, who's an idiot that doesn't know what they're doing. And to an extent, it makes sense. Right? You want to make it so like idiot proof. So they, they have to be able to like find the answer they're looking for and whatnot. Right. Um, the downside being it co- becomes condescending at a certain point. It does. Um, it does. It, uh, it overdoes it. Now I understand like everybody has a different background. And so mm-hmm. in one, you know, you know, in one environment or whatever, they're, they are idiots. Right. Cause I don't mm-hmm. know anything about teeth. You know, I have them, but my <laughs> go to my dentist, he's the genius and I do what he says. Right. So I trust him. Yeah. And so I understand that. I totally get it. We all specialize, no problem. But um, you solve that problem with just simplicity is my, my yeah. attitude. Just make it simple. Give them, you know, on the front page, there's like you know, three lines of, of text, right? Isn't that right? Mm-hmm. There's like yep. decentralized AI. Uh, this is a nonprofit. It's open source. And um, it's a future oracle. We're, we're focused exactly. on future prediction, right? Like that's yeah. three things people need to know about this project right away. And so you put the data where it needs to be, but it's actual data. It's good content. Like don't, don't hide the good content because you're afraid the users are too dumb. Like they're not too dumb. Like, come on. I will so, say, anyway, I'm a little concerned. This is not your website's fault. I go to enter my email address and I have two options. One is my actual email address and the other is just the word sinister for some reason. <laughs> Oh, weird. So I don't know what's going on on my on my uh, my end of my history, but that was a little off. You know what that probably is? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. your history, right? Yeah. Uh, it's probably the name, like the you know, in the HTML, the name that I've applied to that text field. You know, it goes into your history, and it yeah. says, "What is?" And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where sinister came from. I haven't looked anything up related to that. So it was, it was very strange, but. <laughs> Crazy. No, like, like I said, like, especially your main page here, like you said, open source, nonprofit, decentralized AI, future Oracle. And then it's just the call to action, get early access, enter your email. It's super right. straightforward, super easy to understand. And it have, you have the other pages where people can go, if they want more information, they have the option, but you're not bombarding them with it, which is super important. They're, like yeah. I said, you're, you're leaving it up to them, you know, to, to their inclination to seek out more information if need be. You're not forcing them to sift through it by default, which is super right. nice. Right. Totally, totally, exactly. Yeah, so I, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad you appreciate our philosophy of design. Also part of that is, you know, we like again, like I said, we we don't have a ton of UI uh, experience. So we had mm-hmm. to keep it simple. We didn't have a choice. We're like, okay, we gotta keep this simple because <laughs> We don't know what we're doing, you know, so keep it simple and then you'll have the greatest chance of success, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously I could read through the roadmap, but what uh, what is your plan for, I know I kind of asked this before, like a plan for growth, but like uh, the immediate future, you're, you're, you had the beta release and then you're heading into phase one. What does that look like from a user perspective? Okay. So. From a user perspective, what that means is we're gonna we're, we're in beta right now. So you download mm-hmm. it, and what's gonna happen is your computer is gonna do everything that it would do after beta, like in, you know, mm-hmm. probably almost just as good as after launch. But it's gonna you know it's gonna make predictions, it's gonna do all the work. But since we're in beta and we're testing, we don't want to issue real tokens yet because we're testing. Mm-hmm. We don't want to mess anything up, and then you know whatever. Yeah. So. Um, so we're issuing a test token. That's what the end user will experience is that right now we're issuing a test token. As soon as we launch, I mean, you'll still own those tokens, but what's the point of them, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're worthless. There's nothing you can do with them. They don't allow you to vote on the system. They have no utility. So, you know, that, you know, and then you start earning the real token that gives you utility and gives you the ability to vote um, to manage the Satori uh, attention and so um, I guess that is the main 
difference that the end user will experience. And on our side, we're going to take our focus off of developing the infrastructure because that will be completely done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as far as there's always an asterisk with that in programming, you're always yeah. going to come back to it eventually. We've got gold. Now time for patch day one sort of a deal. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but we're going to shift our focus to um, scaling, scaling mm -hmm. the infrastructure or scaling the number of nodes so that when your computer is looking for other data to help it predict better, it can find it. You know, there's a node mm -hmm. predicting this, there's a node predicting that, and it can go out there and find the right data that will may help it make the best prediction. So we have to scale the network in order to, in order to get to the point where we're making a really good prediction. Now that prediction of the world, you know, that's mm -hmm. what it's looking at. It's looking at the world. So that prediction of all these really important data streams that we care about as humans, that is called the Satori public good. So we're going to make the public good because it's free. It's openly available. You can see all the data that's being predicted, all the predictions on the website. You know, you don't even have to download a node to see those predictions. They're just freely available. So that public good, we're going to try to develop that into the best kind of public good we can, which means making the best predictions, which means having the largest network, which means scaling as many nodes as we can get. So that's phase one of the project. And that starts as soon as we launch. And it never ends because we're always going to be providing that, you know, prediction of our communal world um, in perpetuity. Like that's what this network does. In phase two, though, we'll, we'll eventually get to the point where that's really good and we can start to build other things on top of it. Mm -hmm. So in phase two, uh, which, you know, could be years away, I don't know, it could be a while, I don't know how long it'll take to scale. But in phase two, what we're going to do is we're going to open up private predictions where we say, Okay, now that we're making these really good public predictions, we can then associate anybody's private data with our prediction, our, our, our world model. And then we can give you really good predictions of your private data. And those fees can get paid directly to the, you know, the Satori neurons, the Satori miners. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people download the Satori neuron and they're earning this token because they're making a um, they're making a public good right they're playing mm -hmm. a part in making this public good and then later on all the expertise that their computer has been developing can be put to use also making private predictions for you know whoever gov governments companies individuals whatever so it's kind of got this private and public um, approach to it, you know, these two sides of the coin. And uh, I'm most interested in the public side, right? <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think the private side is is good too. I think any way you can in increase the efficiency of the economy and of the earth and help us know what's coming in the future is a good good thing to do. Nice. So I guess the last thing I want, I want to ask here is how do you see your user base growing and changing over time, if at all? Like, obviously, you want to see growth number-wise. How do you see, like, uh, demographics, I guess is the better way, of, like, getting younger users in, older users in? Like, how do you – what's your idea on, like, how different demographics are going to approach this? You know, the first people that are going to um, probably download the, the, the Satori Neuron and run it mm -hmm. are crypto people, right? Because they're, they're familiar with this idea of mining and just turning on a computer program and letting it do the work. And so that's why we're making everything automated. You know, everything's automated. Mm -hmm. We don't need human labor to do anything. So... Um, uh, those are the first people and, and they come with, I mean, 
you know, that could be a lot of different people, but generally they come with some kind of um, economic incentive. They want to earn the token. They're, they want to, you know, um, I don't know. They, they want to risk their computer cycles for this token. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good bet. So there's those people. I think the next people that will kind of get wind of this and want to, you know, participate are AI people who are like, oh, this is a cool project. Um, you know, whether it, you know, makes me token or not, I think it's pretty cool. And, you know, to that end, we're going to be, we've, we've optimized it right now for automatic model creation. You know, everything's automatic. But when, when AI people start getting involved, we can open up the functionality a little bit to say, do you want to kind of choose what data streams your neuron looks at? Do you want to route data to it? You know, publish your own data stream. Do you want to do stuff like that so that you can use this uh, tool that we've created to make predictions about your real world data, you know, like privately, like mm -hmm. you can use it for that. And, you know, it's running, um, it might be doing some work for the network and some work for you and everybody's happy. It doesn't cost anything. It's free. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so I see that as being kind of the next, but I'm just hoping it kind of grows to be anybody and anybody um, because what this, this neuron, it can use any hardware, um, you know, I mean, within reason, any yeah. computerized hardware to make predictions. So traditional blockchain, this is one thing that sets it apart. Traditional blockchain mining, it's that one algorithm. Remember, guess and check? Mm -hmm. It's that one algorithm, and whoever can do that the fastest wins. And yeah. it's because it's that one algorithm, what happens is, um, and it's only put to use on one question, mm -hmm. what happens is whoever can build the fastest uh, hardware to mm -hmm. perform that algorithm is going to win, right? They're going to they're going to have most of the hashing power, and Hence they can the get... issue with getting CPU availability and the priciness of it as of late. I'm guessing. Yeah, like um, they started out on CPUs, and you could use mm -hmm. your laptop to mine, like in 2008 or whatever, yeah. it was, nine or ten. And then very quickly, it was like, well, you kind of have to have GPUs to mine, and people mm -hmm. were like, no problem, I need some GPUs. And then it was very quickly, oh, you kind of have FBGAs and this kind of specialized hardware, and then yeah, it was yeah, like, oh, I don't even know what that is. Oh, <laughs> sorry, they're just what it is is. A CPU is very generalized compute, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It can do anything, but it does it one little step at a time. And mm -hmm. so it takes time. GPUs, they can do a lot of things, but they can't do everything. But they mm -hmm. do it in a very paralyzed fashion, like they're doing multiple things at the same time. Yeah. And so um, they're very much faster at the kinds of computations that they can perform. They can't perform all kinds of computations. And then it comes to, um, uh, th then you can actually build hardware that is a computation. Like the hardware itself mm -hmm. embodies okay. the software. You know, it is the shape of the function. And, and that is the fastest that you can mine. And those things are called ASICs. Okay. So if somebody says, I have an ASIC miner. You know, they got a fast Bitcoin miner. And anybody else who does not cannot compete, not really. So, um, so this is the thing that sets Satori apart from all the other mining activities, uh, traditional blockchain hashing mining activities, mm -hmm. is that Satori can use many AI algorithms to produce a model. And it can produce a model that's very complex, or it can produce a model that's very simple and still provide some value to the network, some predictive value. And each neuron can, can and does look at unique things on the network. So um, even a laptop can provide some value and compete, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't commoditize as fast is what it comes down to. 
Um, This kind of mining, intelligence mining, does not commoditize nearly as fast as um, hashing, hash mining. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, I'm hoping that um, we can eventually build uh, these, these neurons that can, you know, be embedded, you know, embedded neurons in any kind of compute architecture that has extra cycles that they're not using. And so I want it to be as distributed as possible and basically run on any computer out there in the world. And right now we can support, uh, Linux, Mac, Windows. We can't support phones yet, mm-hmm. but we will be able to someday. And, so anyway, I guess I guess that's kind of how did we even get on that topic? <laughs> I don't remember. But yeah, that's the that's one of the reasons. Uh, oh, it was demographics. Yeah. So I think I think hopefully someday it'll it'll be uh, pretty widely distributed. Um, it has a better chance of that than something like Bitcoin, which has hashing mm-hmm. hash mining. I think the general uh, theme, if you want to call it that, for what you're offering is is also a bit more acceptable, like widely acceptable, like open source, nonprofit, you know, the decentralized AI, like the future of Oracle, like the the prediction side of it, I think is is appealing to people on its own even because people yeah. will see them like, oh, that's, I'm interested in that. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Uh, well, we I think that it's not entirely centered around money also helps. Oh, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> even if you're all in on Bitcoin to an extent, it's like there's always going to be that, like, uh, inherent sort of unease, especially with the way it goes up and down, like any crypto, any digital currency or product in general. You know, it. I mean, look, I don't know. I don't keep as close to track on Bitcoin anymore since I sold my... I, I cashed out a while back, but like even at the time, I remember we were watching it go up and down and up and down. It's like, this is wildly, uh, you know, just, it's just all over the place. Uh, yeah. You know, there, there's a point where people were getting paid in Bitcoin, like some of their salaries getting paid in Bitcoin. I'm like, there's no way. I might be making $100,000 for half the year and then $1,000 the rest of the year. <laughs> right. It'd be scary, right? It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind getting part of my income in Bitcoin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, now. But For the, now. the yeah. thing about yeah, like you're saying, it's it's nonprofit, it's open source. You know, with this project, I wanted to do it the right way. Mm-hmm. And I understand, you know, I've had a lot of um well, I've had a few um investors say, why don't we, you know, why don't we give you some money and then you can give us some token. And I've had to tell them that, you know, as helpful as that would be uh, right right now, we don't actually need it. And if we did take it, I, I don't, well, if, first of all, it makes things legally complex, but secondly, the token is, is owned by the network. Right. Like Mm -hmm. that's the right way to do it in my mind. Like I know that, you know, I mean, other people might have different opinions, but I I see the token as being the unit of control over the network. And so the unit of control should be owned by token holders. And these kind of decisions like, um, you know, let me let me buy some token before they even exist uh i i can't ask the token holders if that's okay so i i feel like i can't do it i mean i know and so i think a lot of a lot of projects would be like well you know we got to do it to make money and i understand that maybe that maybe that's the case but if you don't then i don't think you should i think you should give the token to the token holders you know let them let them have it and they control everything, every aspect of the token. You know, you might say, okay, well, there are projects that have like dev funds and ours does yeah. too. So they're like, well, you got to find some way to fund yourself. How are you going to do this? You got to make, you got to eat, don't you? Yeah. So my, my attitude is you have a dev fund and then you give the token holders control over the dev fund. 
you say you can vote the dev fund up or down it's up to you you know how much do you want to pay the developers mm -hmm. and the token holders get to make that choice not the developers not the miners and um doing it that way i think i think it's fair i think it's everything's proper that way so yeah nice awesome yeah no i, I this has been super super informative as someone who had like i said a cursory knowledge coming in so I, I appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge on cryptocurrency, AI in general, leading into it. So that was super, super informative. I'm really excited about Satori. I think this is super interesting and I, I'm hoping it, it grows very rapidly. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, yeah. I look forward to the future of it. So yeah, thank, thank you so much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Had a good time well, thank chatting. Thanks for having me. Really fun. Really. This has been where, great. Can people, where can people go to, to check out your stuff? So satorinet.io is the website. There's links to our Discord if you want to get involved, like really in the community. Uh, there's links to really. I'm trying to keep it simple, right? So we've got Discord for the community. We've got Twitter for like announcements, and we've got you know that emailing list. If you you don't really want to do Twitter, you, you can just get an email once we launch. I mean that's probably. There you go. <laughs> and then you can download it if you want to participate. Nice. And links will be in the description for everybody as well. But oh, awesome. Thank you so much, man. I, like I said, really had a fun time. This has been super, super informative and super interesting. So I, I really do appreciate it. Thanks. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you guys for listening. We will see you next time. Bye.